at Calvary Chapel Santa Barbara family. In these short videos, we're starting from where Pastor Tommy left off in Mark chapter 15, and we're going to work our way through the text and bring ourselves to Resurrection Sunday, starting at Mark chapter 16. We're doing it in four parts, looking at the crucifixion, the death, the effect, and the burial. And today, we want to look at the death of Jesus at the cross. We just consider that at this point, Mark chapter 15, starting at verse 29, Jesus is nailed to the cross. And this is what we read about the scene there, again, starting at verse 29. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking among themselves with the scribes said, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Verse 29 says, Those who passed by blasphemed him. Jesus not only endured mocking and humiliation at the hands of the pagan Roman soldiers, but also from the religious leaders. They blasphemed him, wagging their heads. Verse 29 says, verse 31 says, they mocked and said among themselves, he saved others himself. He cannot save. They were even so bold to say the words recorded in verse 32. Let the Christ descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. But let me tell you something. It is precisely because Jesus would not come down from the cross that we believe in him. Matter of fact, Jesus did something greater than come down from the cross. He rose from the dead. Yet many of them did not believe even then. Which brings us to verse 33, preparing for these last words of Jesus from the cross. Notice this, starting at verse 33. Now, when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, look, he's calling for Elijah. So in the midst of this terrible scene at the cross, verse 33 tells us that there's darkness over the whole land. It's as if it's showing the agony of creation itself in the Creator's suffering. And Mark tells us that it stayed dark for three hours. And at the end of that period, Jesus cried out with those words beginning, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, he said it in Aramaic, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And in that, Jesus quoted Psalm 22, declaring that he fulfilled that passage in both its agony and its victory. There's something very deep and profound to that cry. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knew great pain and suffering both physical and emotional in his life, but he never knew separation of any sort from his father. Now, at least in some sense, Jesus knew it. There was a significant sense in which Jesus felt rightly forsaken by God the Father at this moment. This happened in the sense that, as Second Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, on the cross, Jesus not only endured the withdrawal of the Father's fellowship, but also the actual outpouring of the Father's wrath upon him as a substitute for sinful humanity. And brothers and sisters, this was horrible, yet it fulfilled God's good and loving plan of redemption. That's why Isaiah could say in Isaiah 53, verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Now, I want to be careful here. At the same time, we cannot say that the separation between the Father and the Son at the cross was complete. Because 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself at the cross. 
but certainly there was some sense in which there was a separation, a, 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 a conflict there at the cross. Now, verse 35 says, the response of the people who heard Jesus make that cry, they cried out and they said, look, he's calling for Elijah. I think that's so sad. So sad to consider that Jesus was misunderstood and mocked until the bitter end. These spectators at the cross knew just enough of the Bible to get it really wrong. They speculated wildly. They thought that Elijah might come and rescue Jesus. Look at the ways that they misunderstood Jesus. They misunderstood Jesus because they didn't really hear what he said. Jesus said, Eloi, and they thought he said, Elijah. Listen, if we really want to understand Jesus, we need to hear what Jesus actually says, not what we think he says. Secondly, they misunderstood Jesus because they only heard part of what he said. Jesus said, Eloi, Eloi, and they stopped listening. They didn't listen to what Jesus said next. Why have you forsaken me? If we really want to understand Jesus, we need to hear all of what Jesus says, the whole counsel of God. But they also misunderstood Jesus because they didn't connect what Jesus said to the rest of the scriptures. When Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? They should have made the obvious connection to Psalm 22. And if we want to understand Jesus, we need to connect with what Jesus says to the rest of the scriptures. Now, in verse 36, it says that Jesus prepared for a last cry. It said, then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink, saying, let him alone. Let him see if Elijah will come to take him down. Jesus uh, clearing his throat for that dramatic, beautiful last cry that we read about there in verse 37 of Mark chapter 15, where it says this, And Jesus cried out with a last voice and breathed his last. Brothers and sisters, do you know what he cried out with a loud voice? John chapter 19 verse tells us what Jesus cried out with his last voice. He cried out and he said, It is finished which in the original language could be summarized in one word, to telestai. It's a way of expressing the idea of something being finished, complete, or even paid in full. With Jesus' last cry that he wanted to clear his throat with, with that sour wine, a, a thing, something that soldiers commonly drank, Jesus cleared his throat so he could give a loud and distinct cry saying, It is finished. Do you understand that sometime before Jesus breathed his last, as verse 37 says, that Jesus proclaimed to all the world that the price had been paid, that the debt was fulfilled, that he had accomplished what he came to do. He made reconciliation between God and man by paying our debt completely at the cross. Isn't this a beautiful idea? That at some time before Jesus gave his last breath, this divine transaction took place. God the Father set upon Jesus all the guilt and all the wrath that our sin deserved, and Jesus bore it within himself perfectly, totally satisfying the wrath of God towards us, towards all who believe. Have you believed? Have you received? Have you thanked God today that not only Jesus paid the price, but that he cleared his throat so he could cry it out loud and clear and everyone would know? I hope you know, and I hope you thank God today for the great redemption that Jesus Christ purchased for you at the cross.